Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by LastPass. LastPass is an award-winning security solution that helps millions of individuals and over 70,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. Businesses can maximize productivity while still maintaining effortless, strong security with LastPass. LastPass can minimize risk and give your IT team a breakthrough integrated single sign-on, password management, and multi-factor authentication solution. Transparent Tribe updates Crimson Rat. Cuba, North Korea, and Saudi Arabia are also interested in influencing the upcoming U.S. election. The University of Utah restored from backups after a ransomware attack, but paid the ransom to prevent the crooks from publishing stolen data. Uber's former CSO has been charged with allegedly covering up a hack the company sustained in 2016. Justin Harvey from Accenture on how the pandemic has affected incident response. Gerald Boucheld from Log Me In on how secure remote access may or may not be. And a popular fertility app was found to be sharing data with advertisers without users' permission. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, August 21st, 2020. Kaspersky has released a report on the continuing activities of Transparent Tribe, also known as Project M and Mythic Leopard, a cyber espionage group actively deploying the Crimson Rat against its targets. Crimson Rat has been upgraded for the current campaign, with server-side management of infected machines and a newly discovered component dubbed USB Worm that infects and steals files from removable drives. Attribution of Transparent Tribe, which has been active since at least 2013, remains murky, but Palo Alto Networks and others have seen signs of an association with Pakistan. In the past, the group has primarily targeted Indian military and government personnel, but Kaspersky says this recent campaign shows an increased interest in targets in Afghanistan. William Evanina, the director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, has added a few governments to the list of those who appear interested in influencing U.S. elections, CyberScoop reports. He said Cuba, North Korea, and Saudi Arabia want to be able to provide their optics for discord in the United States. Evanina added that efforts by those countries aren't rising to the level of the big three, namely Russia, China, and Iran. His comment about discord is suggestive. After a ransomware attack that hit its College of Social and Behavioral Sciences on July 19th, the University of Utah paid its extortionists, bleeping computer reports. The university said in its disclosure that the decision to pay was reached in close consultation with its insurance carrier and that the amount it turned over to the attackers was 457000 $59.24. ZDNet says the university was able to restore systems and data from backups, but that it decided to pay the ransom to prevent the criminals from releasing the personal data they'd stolen in the course of the attack. The disclosure said in part, quote, The university's cyber insurance policy paid part of the ransom and the university covered the remainder. No tuition, grant, donation, state, or taxpayer funds were used to pay the ransom. End quote. Which ransomware gang was behind the attack remains undisclosed, but MSISOFT told ZDNet that the attack looked like the work of NetWalker, which has made a specialty of hitting universities. It's hard to see how paying the ransom would keep criminals from releasing data. The agreement seems unenforceable. After all, it's not really the sort of contractual transaction one could enforce in civil court, and stolen data can quickly find their way into other hands. So there's a great deal of hope behind the decision. MSISOFT called the agreement a pinky promise made by criminals. How this high degree of uncertainty and forced misplaced trust figured into the cost-benefit calculus is unclear. There's also the problem that paying ransom encourages the growth of a bandit economy. But on balance, the insurer's involvement seems a positive sign. 
security informed by actuarial insight is likely to be better security. Good building fire codes, for example, came more from the insurance industry than from government action. Government action was the final result, but it followed the underwriter's lead. The U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of California has filed a criminal complaint charging Joseph Sullivan with obstruction of justice and misprision of a felony in connection with the attempted cover-up of the 2016 hack of Uber Technologies Incorporated. When he was chief security officer of Uber, Mr. Sullivan is alleged to have paid hackers a six-figure payment in exchange for their silence about their undisclosed theft of personally identifying information connected to some 57 million Uber drivers and passengers. Mr. Sullivan is said to have channeled the payments through a corporate bug bounty program with a view to concealing information about the breach from the Federal Trade Commission. The payment is reported to have been $100,000 in the form of Bitcoin, the criminal recipients of which were asked to enter into a non-disclosure agreement that included a false representation that the hackers did not take or store any data. The two hackers were eventually arrested and prosecuted, and they accepted guilty pleas. Mr. Sullivan is also alleged to have kept information about the hack from the new management team that arrived at Uber in 2017. Android Headlines reports that Mr. Sullivan's attorneys say the charges are without merit and that any decisions about disclosure were reached collaboratively by the company's leadership as a whole. Himself a former federal prosecutor, Mr. Sullivan is currently chief security officer of Cloudflare. This case is believed to represent the first prosecution of a CSO on charges of concealing a data breach. The Washington Post reports that the popular fertility app Premom was sharing customer data with three Chinese advertising companies without users' permission or knowledge. Researchers at the International Digital Accountability Council, IDAC, found that Premom was sharing IP and MAC addresses, Android IDs, hardware identifiers, Bluetooth information, and geolocation data. IDAC said in a letter to the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, quote, Non-resettable hardware identifiers are personally identifiable information because they are tied to a user's device, and it is almost impossible for a user to reset them or erase their digital footprint, thereby allowing companies with this information to infer who the individual users are. Additionally, by sending multiple device identifiers and geolocation data together, third parties can infer who Premom's users are, end quote. Premom told The Post that it does not currently use two of the advertising companies, and it said on August 6 that it was in the process of removing the third company's access to the app. IDAC confirmed that the data transmissions had ceased after the app was updated on August 7. The researchers note that users who haven't updated the app may still be sharing data. Researchers at Mitiga identified crypto mining malware embedded in a community Amazon machine instance, or AMI, used to spin up an AWS EC2 server. The malware had been running for years on a server owned by a financial institution. The researchers say the incident highlights the risk of using community AMIs, which can be created by anyone and placed in the AWS marketplace. ThreatPost notes that Amazon itself urges caution when deploying community AMIs, saying, You should treat shared AMIs as you would any foreign code that you might consider deploying in your own data center and perform the appropriate due diligence. We recommend that you get an AMI from a trusted source. End quote. Matiga similarly notes that AMIs provided by trusted vendors on the AWS marketplace do not present any such risk. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. If you haven't already done so, take a look at Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. We look at it. The CyberWire staff subscribes and consults it daily. The web is rich with indicators and warnings, but it's nearly impossible to collect them by eyeballing the internet yourself, no matter how many analysts you might have on staff. And we're betting that however many you have, you haven't got enough. Recorded Future does the hard work for you by automatically collecting and organizing the entire web to identify new vulnerabilities and emerging threat indicators. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email to get the top trending technical indicators crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, and suspicious IP addresses. 
Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash cyberwire to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. The folks at identity and access management firm LastPass recently released the results of their study looking at the security of remote access, which, of course, has received increased scrutiny since the pandemic. Gerald Bouchelt is CISO at LogMeIn, parent company of LastPass, and he joins us with their findings. We found that about uh, 96% of uh, all IT decision makers that we were able to, um, to work with uh, found that um, there is a huge impact of their IAM strategy with the um, requirement, with the recent requirements to uh, fully support a uh, remote workforce. Pretty much every organization uh, has started to look at their uh, identity and access manage- management strategy across the board and wanted to make sure that they are doing the right things by their employees, but also obviously for, for their own uh, uh, interest as an organization. I think what's really interesting in this kind of context is that uh, if once you start to go into a highly scalable, um, zero trust kind of environment where you're leveraging uh, software as a services, where you're managing uh, remote proxies in order to move forward and really uh, de-emphasizing the file, the traditional perimeter, the traditional firewall around um, the organization, it is uh, uh, the identity of the user that act, interacts with the, the services that ultimately is the, the, the last and best um, way of uh, defending what is going on and making sure that uh, folks are properly authorized. So I think what's uh, what we're seeing here is like the uh, uh, renewed interest, um, the renewed high interest in uh, optimizing IAM strategy is really born out of the, uh, the need that uh, traditional kind of uh, network-based segmentation uh, for, for users um, uh, perimeters, uh, trusted perimeters, et cetera, are really so, uh, have crumbled now. It's like they're, they're no longer crumbling, they have crumbled. And uh, we have to adopt to this new situation um, that we're facing ourselves and that we've been moving to for quite a few years, to be honest with you, uh, now through much uh, strengthened and improved IAM programs. Now, one of the findings here that caught my eye was uh, that 62% believe multi factor authentication is the most effective way to secure a remote workforce. Two thoughts there. I mean, obviously good that multi-factor is on people's minds, but I guess I was a little surprised that the number was that low. Yeah, it's, um, that's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to really uh, um, get, uh, wrap my head around, it's like, especially since we've seen in other reports that uh, the adoption of multi-factor authentication technology in, um, uh, in, in, in the workplace versus like um, private um, activity actually lags, right? So there's less uh, businesses that have enabled MFA versus... Uh, versus individuals uh, uh, securing their banking accounts or their other uh, important accounts across the board. So I think it's just uh, still taking time. The, the idea that business leaders have uh, not uh, um, fully embraced MFA is an unfortunate reality at this point in time. And I think it um, dates back to the days when uh, rolling out MFA was really hard, right? It's like if you think back, mm-hmm. it's like setting up a... Um, um, and, uh, like a secure ID or, or, or something like that. It requires server infrastructure. It requires distribution of physical tokens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that is still burned into the back of a lot of uh, IT decision makers' mind that it's like MFA is hard, it's costly, it, um, it is not easy to do. It's like we we have now technologies um, that we offer from LogMeIn, actually. It's like that uh, that do make it very easy for um, for for IT departments, even small ones, to roll out multi-factor as a service and as such uh, get running very quickly. So I, th- I would hope that that these types of technologies really are, are going to be aggressively uh, being adopted across industry very soon, so that we're getting from sixty-two to uh, uh, similar for the other questions, like to close to a hundred. Yeah, it strikes me that it's a, it's an opportunity for, to, um, I don't know, instill a sense of ownership in your users that, you know, you're, you're working from home now, um, you know, you can't rely on the physical building that you used to come to to be your defensive, you know, framework that it's, you know, we're, 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 we're relying on you to, uh, to help us here. I, I think just from a mindset point of view, that's, that's an opportunity, it seems to me. I, I totally agree. It's like, and uh, it's like it goes back to the uh, 
the old bad adage that uh, users are the weakest link in the chain. It's like, I disagree with this wholeheartedly. A badly trained user is uh, probably the weakest link in your chain, but uh, a well-trained user or somebody who is just reasonably aware of what's going on in their world, uh, they're actually your strongest assets that you can have because ultimately they know best what is okay and what is not okay. And uh, starting from that point, so I think you really need to structure your overall security program around those kind of like educational tasks and to making sure that everyone gets the right level of understanding about how their respective work ultimately can affect the overall security posture of the company, whether it's uh, an end user that really does not have a lot of technical responsibility or background, or whether it's somebody who is uh, architecting or managing a large complex environments. H having those folks properly enabled and have, making sure that they understand what kind of expectations um, we would have for them from a security posture perspective ultimately makes the overall program so much stronger than uh, just relying on traditional kind of controls or, or centralized teams that um, are aiming to do everything but really can't due to resource uh, constraints. That's Gerald Bouchelt from Log Me In. There's an extended version of our interview available on CyberWire Pro. Check it out on our website, thecyberwire.com. And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Email is still the number one attack vector the bad guys use, with a whopping 91% of cyber attacks beginning with phishing. But email hacking is much more than phishing and launching malware. Find out how to protect your organization in an on-demand webinar by Roger A. Grimes, Know Before's data-driven defense evangelist. Roger walks you through 10 incredible ways you can be hacked by email and how to stop the bad guys. And he also shares a hacking demo by Know Before's chief hacking officer, Kevin Mitnick. So check out the 10 incredible ways where you'll learn how silent malware launch, remote password hash capture, and rogue rules work, why rogue documents, establishing fake relationships, and compromising a user's ethics are so effective, details behind clickjacking and web beacons, and how to defend against all of these. Go to knowbefore.com slash 10 ways and watch the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral 4 dot com slash numerals 1 and 0 W-A-Y-S. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Justin Harvey. He is the Global Incident Response Leader at Accenture. Justin, it's always great to have you back. Uh, I wanted to check in with you to see how and your incident response team have had to adjust the work you're doing since so many of us are working remotely now when it comes to this pandemic. What's going on with you and your team? Well, luckily, we had a head start because we were already a remote team. So globally, uh, we do have uh, uh, cyber fusion centers in D.C. and London and, and and various other cities around the globe where our incident responders would occasionally go into. And I, I'm sure we had some full-time employees there uh, going in and out. But for the most part, our incident response team was already working from home. But that doesn't mean that uh, the industry has all gone to virtually remote incident response. Uh, I know that from previously, from co uh, before the pandemic, uh, we would go on site probably about 20 to 30% of the time. Of course, that 20 to 30% now has gone to zero. We haven't gone on site uh, anywhere globally since the pandemic began. But we've seen a huge uptick in ransomware and various other types of attacks over the last few months. Um, it's been a... A challenge adapting to this, not because of our work environment, but because uh, we do send equipment out. Uh, we have a network sensor and we have various other system type uh, uh, tools that we typically send to our clients in the event of an incident. And uh, that's more difficult because previously we've stockpiled those in our cyber fusion centers and lo and behold, we don't have anyone at those cyber fusion centers. So if, mm -hmm. we, do, mm -hmm. if we do need to ship something, uh, then, it, then it takes a little bit longer to get someone into the office. And I think because of that, you know, we've, we've had to make do. We've been more reliant upon the cloud and on uh, virtual machine technologies with our clients. And I think that's actually been uh, turning out pretty positively. Have you been given any insights on how you might approach things, even when the pandemic 
is over, does this inform any adjustments that you might make on the other side? Uh, I, I believe so, yes. Uh, there, we're probably looking at moving toward a, a completely virtual model where we can actually use a supplier that has a uh, imaging facility. So if we want to send a network sensor out to the other side of the country, we could just pick up the phone or go on the web and, and do a virtual order and then have our image um, burned onto a drive, which then would go into another piece of hardware that this other company would maintain. So hmm. I, I think it's forcing us to address a uh, a more layered approach to our supply chain. I also know that uh, previously our clients many times would have physical war rooms and have everyone there on site for some of the larger investigations. And, and we've done a few of these major type operations over the last few months, not only in the United States, but but in Brazil, uh, in Italy, in Germany, uh, particularly around uh, critical infrastructure. And it's been harder on our clients adjusting to a fully remote uh, environment uh, than we have. And I think that's probably easing a little bit now. Everyone's kind of understanding how to work from home and all of the the difficulties like coming off of mute, <laughs> mute on a <laughs> on a conference call, um, right, buying good <laughs> microphones and headphones and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I get nailed with that because I've got two mutes: one on my on my speakerphone and <laughs> and right. one on my Microsoft Teams, and and uh, that's a, it's a little embarrassing with clients occasionally. But I think that more enterprises are going to be fully remote on IR, and I think it's just going to be part of the new uh, part of the new normal, Dave. Hmm. All right. Well, Justin Harvey, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Proofpoints Observe It, the leading people-centric insider threat management solution. Learn more at observeit.com. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for CyberWire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. If you're looking for something to do over the weekend, be sure to check out Research Saturday. This week, I speak with Craig Williams from Cisco Talos on adversarial use of current events as lures. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Ivan, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Be sure to catch Dragos' next webinar on August 26, where I will join Dragos' VP of Threat Intelligence, Sergio Caltagirone, to talk about the ABCs of ICS threat activity groups. We'll answer the questions that everybody wants to know, like, what are the threat activity groups? Why are they important? How are they identified? And how are they analyzed? Visit dragos.com slash events. That's dragos.com slash events. We hope to see you there, and we thank Dregos for sponsoring our show.